Uh, and at that point, I'll hand over to my colleague, uh, Richard, to introduce himself for a speaker. Thanks very much. So we're very um, privileged to have Professor Gavin Andrews with us today. Um, Gavin uh, comes from McMaster University in Canada and uh, flew in a couple of days ago. And we've, I think it's fair to say that even I have been incredibly energised by Gavin's enthusiasm for the seminar series and also the last couple of days because of the energy that he's brought to our own discussions about where we can take some of this work collectively together. Um, I'll not say too much about Gavin's story because he actually goes through that as part of what he's going to, to discuss today, but suffice to say that Gavin is probably um, the person um, globally who has brought geography and nursing together. When we, you know, mentioned this yesterday, he was very modest, but I think actually it's fair to say that he, he has done more than anybody to, to bring these two disciplines together. And in doing that has been at the edge and the cutting edge of both of those disciplines, which is a very unique place to be, to be able to straddle two disciplines and make sure that you're at the forefront of both. Um, and as well as that, he does all sorts of work within gerontology, so he's got another kind of third, which he's also at the edge of as well. Um, so it's got kind of one kind of story I'll let him explain, but thank you so much, Gavin, for coming over to talk to us today and for the time we spent with Ian and I and others over the last couple of days. We really are appreciative. So, I'll pass over to Gavin Andrews. So thanks very much for that uh, very kind introduction. Um, I hopefully I'll show though in the presentation today that the geography of nursing is really um, uh, 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 it, it's an endeavour that's uh, involved quite a few scholars and uh, I'm just uh, happy to have articulated that in some way uh, in the last few years. So um, as my uh, title suggests, today I want to talk about the, the history, state of the art uh, and uh, the potential future of a field of research that in recent years has become known uh, as the geography of nursing. And um, as you can see by this uh, overview here, I'll be uh, covering quite a lot of ground in the uh, next hour, um, uh, quite a few uh, themes. I'm going to talk about, um, I'm going to give, show, tell you a little bit about myself and how I came to sort of try and connect geography and nursing in my own career. Um, then I'm going to uh, um, talk about the history of, uh, of geography and nursing and really sort of try and uh, demonstrate that it's really not just an endeavor, the connection has just, uh, not just been made in the last 20 years, it goes back hundreds if not thousands of years. Then I'm gonna say why, of this, why is this a re-emerging interest uh, in, in geography? What are the factors that have suddenly made geography relevant uh, to nursing research and practice in the last 20 years? I'm gonna overview some of the theoretical traditions within the geography of nursing um, in particular focusing on spatial science versus a social constructivist approach, um, broadly speaking qualitative and quantitative research. Um, I'm going to uh, give you an, an outline of some of the empirical interests and areas in the geography of nursing, what kinds of things are we looking at uh, in an applied sense. And then the final, um, the final third of the talk um, will be more visionary and I'm going to argue that um, scholars could engage with a, an emerging theoretical tradition in human geography called non-representational theory. But I'll leave it till I get to that to explain what that is. So, um, my story. Um, well, that's a picture of me in, not 90, uh, uh, in, uh, I think, was I, I was an undergraduate then. Uh, uh, but I want to start a little bit later, uh, in 1996. Uh, in 1996, I was uh, finishing off my PhD uh, in medical and health geography at the University of Nottingham. Um, and the specific subject of my PhD uh, was a little dry, to say the least. It was how the 1993 UK Care and the Community Act impacted upon the private residential and nursing home sectors for older people. The macro scale, I was looking at trends, distributive features in the sector, a sector under decline, and at a micro level, I was looking at homes themselves and the impact 
of financial hardships on home life and residents and proprietors. But as the subject suggests, I had my foot really in two doors. Um, Disciplinary-wise, I was clearly a geographer, whilst in terms of my empirical interests, I was relatively well aligned to nursing and nursing research. And back then, in the late 90s, the job market was quite healthy. You could work in academia where you wanted. Uh, so I was clearly presented with two choices. Either stay in geography and work in a geography department where everybody would share my perspective, but no one really my empirical interests, or go and work in a nursing department or faculty where everybody would share my empirical interests, but probably no one my perspective. So back then, for some reason, uh, being in geography for a few years, I thought geographers were a little bit boring. Um, I chose nursing and uh, started to apply for faculty positions in nursing departments. However, surprise, surprise, I found that no one was advertising for a geography nurse or a, n or a nurse geographer. So what to do, I thought. Um, well, at that time, health economics was on the rise. So I thought, I know, I'll pretend to be a health economist. And there were a number of nursing departments advertising for health economists to work in them. Um, so I applied for these, uh, these jobs. Uh, I thought the political economy perspective of my PhD I mentioned earlier would just about cover health economics. And you know, I, I was successful. I landed a job teaching health economics at Buckingham Children's University College, which is now Buckingham Bucks New University. Um, so I was teaching health economics to nurses. I was terrible at it. Uh, there was not even a hint of econometrics in it. I was using sort of ample uh, exa uh, using examples of like buying and selling oranges and apples and Mars bars to try and explain to myself more than anything. <laughs> the price mechanism and diminishing marginal utility and things like that. And of course, all of my education, all the, all of the, all the modules I put on, uh, included a, a heavy dose of geography, so, just so I could get through. After a while, um, people, my colleagues, realized I wasn't really an economist, but it didn't really seem to matter. Uh, back in those days, I was just simply one of the ologists in my nursing faculty, you know, one of the ologists, one of the people who were not registered nurses and taught non-clinical modules. Um, so it was fine, you know, uh, gradually I changed my teaching towards geography and no one, no one cared. Although I did get some strange comments at that time. Uh, I remember a boss once asking me, so it's all going well, Gavin, but you know, when are you going to publish in the National Geographic? I really want to <laughs> see that. And I was like, oh dear, she doesn't know what geography is. Um, a few years passed and in 2001 I moved to the Faculty of Nursing uh, in Toronto, Canada. And it was around about this time that things changed. And the story's now not about me, it's about the literature. Uh, and what happened was instead of me bringing geography to nursing and nurse education, geography started coming to me. And what we saw is we saw nursing research and nurse researchers starting to draw explicitly on geography as a discipline and geographical concepts to frame their studies. Now, this wasn't a new generation of researchers that were doing this, nor was it an empirical endeavor. We saw some key concepts such as space and place emerge in nursing research and in the work of established theorists and scholars at the time. And there's many more than these, but nurses, nurse researchers here in this room will recognize these people. Joan Lyshenko, who was the editor of Nursing Philosophy at the time, started to talk about moral space. Marguerite Sandralowski, that famous nurse qualitative researcher in the US, started talking about pr place, presence, and identity. Ma Mary Ellen Perkis started to talking about quality space in the research, and Ruth Malone in the US about the concept of distal nursing and the way that nurses are becoming more morally and spatially distant from their patients due to new technologies. And we had in the UK as well the RCN talking about uh, in terms of knowledge translation, clinical context. And really, as a geographer, I saw context as being quite closely aligned to place. These key, um, com these, these key commentators and their work, I think, laid the basis for what now is more than 100 articles in the geography of nursing. If you just did a Google Scholar search of nursing, geography, space, place, there's over 100. We also saw at the time many research centers uh, uh, being launched and institutes in nursing departments and faculties around the Western world that were focusing to some extent on the spatial aspects of health and healthcare. 
So for example, when I turned up at the University of Toronto in Canada, they were just launching a centre called Healthcare Technology in Place, which made me feel very at home. But before I get carried away, I want us to take a, a giant step backwards, and I want to talk about the precedents for this kind of research, because it's not, as I said at the beginning of the talk, entirely new. It's important to realize that geography, medicine, and geography and nursing has been connected for hundreds and thousands of years. So as many review articles note, some of the earliest mentions of places and geography in the context of health can be found in the 5th century BC in Apocrisy's Airs, Waters and Places. And this document provided guidance for traveling physicians uh, in terms of what to expect when they enter a new location. And it conveyed in simple terms, as understood then, that local disease was, an it was a, a product of local environmental factors, particularly water sources, the direction of prevailing winds and seasonal variations. And about the same time, and this is often neglected, uh, references to geographical features appeared in ancient Chinese and Indian medicine, what we now categorize as traditional medicine. Uh, particularly, this, the, the early writings here equated local environments and diets and lifestyle to the occurrence of specific diseases and conditions. Later on in the first century AD, we had Greco Roman scholars and clinicians providing powerful descriptions of the urban to rural spread of in contagious disease and the impacts on people, on homes, and city settlement streets. During the Middle Ages, that's the fifth century AD until the 14th century. We saw the rise of Christianity in European and Middle and East, Eastern countries during the Age of Faith, linking nature, landscape, and health under tight religious explanations. However, for the first time, scholars were thinking about populations and cohorts of people in their theorizations. Later on, during the 14th century onwards, during the Renaissance, the, uh, we saw uh, the, the, the European Age of Exploration involving the European discovery of newfound lands and peoples, an early colonial history. And at this time, scholars began to consider the climatic and other conditions that lead to diseases in other countries and other places. And they ought describe the affliction, afflictions affecting explorers themselves, in particular through the, case, through the use of meticulous and detailed record keeping on the health of ships, crews, and companies. Meanwhile, at home, um, in Europe, the era of the great pandemics, such as the Black Death, ushered in observations on the causes uh, of disease and the environmental uh, factors associated with them. So it goes back thousands of years. You know, health geography may be 60, 70 years old as a discipline, medical health geography, but it goes back way beyond that to the origins of medical thought. And we have to also see precedents we see geography in the, in, at the origins of nursing as well, and nursing scholarship. Nursing uh, research and uh, nursing scholarship has always been concerned with environment to some degree, way before any contemporary social science intervention in nursing and nursing research. The key fundamental question posed by generations of nurses, has, and spanning at well over a century, has been what is nursing environment? And a story told hundreds of times, and I'm sure you're familiar with it, uh, in nursing schools all over the world, is that you know, uh, environment is a central theme in Florence Nightingale's Notes on Nursing, what it is and what it is not. At the macro scale, Notes considered environment quite straightforwardly as the conditions in cities and urban areas, and at the micro scale, the conditions, varieties, arrangements, and behaviors and social interactions in patients' rooms. So here in Nightingale's work, a precedent was clearly set, that a, there was a heavy geographical cornerstone laid at the various earliest foundations, the very definition of the purposes of modern contemporary nursing, and for public health, for that matter. And in short, for Nightingale and most nurses thereafter, nursing is about more than just caring tasks. It incorporates a fundamental responsibility for the places where potential patients and patients find themselves. Later, 
uh, from the mid-20th century onwards, nursing environment resurfaces strongly uh, with an acad early academic nursing and, uh, and, uh, and nurse education, specifically as one meta-paradigm of nursing theory. The other you know, meta-paradigms being person and health. Um, and in classical nursing theory, nursing environment is part of a more general product of its time to explain nursing in one shot. This itself is part of a wider aim to find a grand theory to help support, justify, secure and build a legitimate, distinct, bona fide profession and academic discipline worthy of independence from doctors and a place in universities. Now we all know so that such big theory and grand theories of nursing have gradually given away in recent years particularly in the context of more changing and favourable academic and institutional contexts for nurse researchers. And we now have more fragmented, specialised and critical theorisations of nursing. Um, so big nursing theory is not what it was. So back to the present. Why then, since the late 1990s, of nurse researchers, I think, why have they become particularly interested in geography and started to draw on geography? Why this re-emergence of, uh, of interest? Well, there's no easy answer. And all I can really do, I think, is point to a range of partial influences, a number of fundamental changes in health and healthcare that have strongly geographical features. Hence, I think that these beg a geographical analysis of one's own professional discipline. The first of these is increasing diffusion and diversity in healthcare. So for many post-war decades, almost all healthcare was hospital-based, discreet and bounded. But things have changed dramatically in recent years, A spatial diffusion of healthcare and healthcare services has occurred through both a growth in smaller, more specialised community-based services and larger institutions providing secondary care that reaches beyond their physical walls. And in many respects we can say that healthcare is provided here, there and everywhere. It's provided where people live, their homes, where people work, where they travel and where they shop. And this is not a surface trend. You know, it's just, it's not, it's not something that, uh, you know, we, uh, 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 a line that we can put out there. It's supported by statistics. And in the 21st century, and lots of research backs this up, the majority of all healthcare services and all expenditure on healthcare services has become community-based. Now, the extent to which this change from hospital to community has been motivated by financial concerns or to improve patients' experiences and outcomes is certainly debatable. Nevertheless, it has involved a transfer of responsibility to people and places on two scales. The first of these is communities and neighbourhoods. Once viewed by medicine and policy makers and health managers as administrative units on areas or areas on maps to be serviced, communities and neighbourhoods have now been repositioned as the social terrains of healthcare, which have needs but also the capacity to support and care for themselves. The second scale or level is families and homes. Once viewed as places too unsafe for caring, homes have emerged as the preferred environment for increasing range of healthcare and healthcare services. Underpinning these trends are new technologies. New technologies facilitate care remote from hospitals and the development of services through improving communication, monitoring and procedures over distance. Contemporary examples include telephone triage, telehealth, health information on the internet, remote monitoring and intervention technologies, robotic surgery, and distance work for diagnostic acute and rehab care. Meanwhile, within hospitals, technologies have changed the spatial relationships between people, making, for example, health professionals more physically and even emotionally distant from their patients as their tasks become orientated around monitoring equipment rather than building interpersonal relationships. 
The second theme or motivation has been changes within hospitals as places. The persistent structural and financial reform of traditional institutional settings as such hospitals, including their subjection to new economic conditions and delivery models, changes not only their function but also their character. Hospitals were once a uh, highly ordered, bland symbols of st sterility and efficiency. But they are now being reinvented under corporate planning and corporate culture as inviting, entertaining, even adventurous spaces of consumption. We sit in North America, where I am from, with hospital atriums these days, they resemble shopping malls. There's you know, fast food restaurants, there's entertainment. You know, they are not like the, the hospitals of old. Now, this reimagining of the hospital as a place and a place of consumption has obviously been inspired by neoliberal reforms and thinking. Um, and they, this neoliberal agenda is to sell settings to consumers and donors alike. But what is important is these changes within hospitals have far-reaching implications for the people that work in them, the demands on people working on them, and their embodied emotional responses and the changing nature of their emotional labor, and that includes nurses. The third reason, or the third motivation, I think, for a geographical perspective, is the social model of health, and we're all familiar with that, but I like to think it as a, of it as a social-spatial model of health. In the last two or three decades, the prominence of the social model of health and the allied emergence of a new public health has it involved an acknowledgement that health and disease is strongly influenced by factors that lie outside of healthcare institutions and outside the receipt of medicine and even nursing in communities. And this has involved a, a realization that place matters to health. Oh, where one lives, where one works, and how one uses the environment has profound health implications. And mirroring these trends, there's been spatial turns across many health sciences. And it's involved a greater the emergence of a greater volume of studies, particularly in social epidemiology, population health, public health research, that are focused conceptually on place and space and other geographical concepts. And finally, I think in terms of a motivation, is place in policy and administration. Space, place, and other geographical concepts are becoming more central to public policy and administration decision making, falling under the rubric of what Brenner calls the rescaling of statehood under neoliberalism. Two notable developments um, uh, have occurred uh, and, and are part of this new spatial logic. First, geographical decentralization of the administration of healthcare has occurred. Indeed, this is one of the more widespread transformations that have hit public sectors in recent decades. We have a, a move towards greater local control, and terms that are used to describe changes include regionalization, devolution, decentralization, deconcentration. Now, often the switch to more local control over decision-making in healthcare is associated with offloading decisions and creating efficiencies. Um, and that's what critics would say. But nevertheless, we see this spatial movement. Secondly, under the rescaling of statehood, is increasing place-based policy, which has a great uptake in the UK, for instance, under area-based initiatives. So I think those are the structural changes within healthcare that have really motivated nurses and other health scientists to start looking at geography. It seems to make sense under these, these kinds of changes to, to, to use geography uh, because it seems to speak to them um, and to be able to open up new avenues of inquiry. I'm going to get a little bit more theoretical um, now uh, and I want to examine the theoretical traditions that underpin the current geography of nursing. You know, what kinds of theories and approaches underpin the empirical research. So the first one is spatial science. Um, a lot of nurse researchers doing geography at the moment are doing GIS and things like that. But there is, there is a, a good theoretical ideas that underpin that kind of research. So really originating in a positivistic tradition in the 1950s and 60s, space under spatial science is understood as an underlying template for human agency. Space is understood as a featureless, neutral surface on which life unfolds. 
Such an understanding of space initially paints a picture of space that's somewhat abstract, you know, space being meaningless. However, when things such as nurses, patients, facilities, political boundaries, disease events are located on space, space then begins to represent substantial features and challenges for human life. This is because in research terms, space then becomes mathematically distinguishable and dividable. You can start a map. So at one level, where things are located, rates, volumes and other localised measures become visible and calculable. At another level, between points, times, distances, movements and differences become visible and calculable. Now the assumption behind treating space in this way is that it's possible to find spatial patterns to health and disease and social life in collective human existence. The idea is that human life has some kind of fundamental and underlying geometry. Now, under, it, combined with spatial science, there have been other approaches and other theories. More practically, as I said, the use of GIS in nursing research, are also political ecologies underpinning theory, and political economy, particularly in terms of distributive features of services. The second major theoretical tradition in nursing, in geographies of nursing, has been social constructivism. This approach is largely qualitative and considers places not as locations or maps, but places as social and cultural phenomena that are occupied, felt, and felt about. So this room isn't, you know, four walls, some lights, and tables and chairs. It's a social and cultural phenomenon. We feel this room. We have a part of this room. It has is a part of us right now, and we'll remember it, and it will mean something to us. So. Under social constructivism, commentators have, have, have considered how people make places and places make people. And this process of making starts with the concept of embedded knowledge. And this, this based on Heidegger's ideas, posits that humans can only relate to themselves and beyond themselves through their situation, through their literally being in the world, and their consciousness of other things in the world around them. The other concepts are intentionality and essence, and they're very important in this tradition. With regard to intentionality, it's posited and argued it that through human presence, perception and judgment, places are ascribed meaning. Places have meaning. From a phenomenological standpoint, just as objects' uses are critical to their meaning, this is about writing, I objects are about what humans do with them, so are places' uses critical to their meaning. Places are also about what humans do in them. Which, of course, involves an almost infinite range of possibilities. To some people, nursing homes care. To some people, nursing homes confine, etc., etc. With regard to essences, just as objects possess essences, the facets that influence what we feel emotionally about them, so do places. Places have qualities that influence what we feel emotionally about and when we're in them. Now, humanistic writers, uh, right back uh, to the 1960s and 70s, explain that intentionality and essences result in individuals feeling a sense of place. And places evoking a broad range of emotions from the personally very positive, like happiness, contentment, excitement, to the personally quite negative, feelings of anger, fear, loss, sadness. And these all occur in healthcare settings. We all recognize them in, within healthcare settings. The argument follows that feelings, these feelings, when experienced over time, can develop into identities and attachments with places. Also, what is important is collective dimensions and cultural dimensions. When members of demographic, social or cultural groups share identities and attachments and agency in places, either agreed or subconscious, cultures of places develop. These can be unique and specific. So we, we all think about workplace cultures, particular academic environments or clinical environments we, we, we've worked in, and cultures of positivity or negativity. You know, those places have those those, those cultures through these kinds of processes. I'm going to outline uh, just briefly now some of the uh, empirical interests or uh, areas or fields in the geography of nursing. Now, I put two or three um, references for each area, but really there's 20 now for each. 
Um, and so the, 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 there's much more literature than just shown on this, this uh, simple slide. Basically, though, geographies of nursing have investigated how the job category of nurse and the numerous activities involved in nursing relate dynamically to places. A range of things and relationships have been articulated, including how places characterize particular professional subspecialties of nursing, like gerontology, pediatrics, acute care, that kind of thing. Another strand of research look, considers how places possess attachments, symbolism, and identities that are somewhat contested by nurses. So Halford Lenner's research here looks at how hospitals mean different things to doctors and nurses, and how they have their spaces they own and they control, and how sometimes these sort of spatial power relationships butt up against each other. Another strand of research looks at how places impact upon the outcomes of focused interventions. Uh, people have done, uh, nurses have done RCTs, for instance, on childbirth using, you know, one particular place home versus a particular type of ward designed in one way, another ward, and have, uh, have sort of used place in, as a focused intervention in itself. Other researchers looked at uh, different places and their impact upon worker-patient interactions and relationships. A uh, field of research has looked at in, the impact of places on interprofessional interactions and relationships. We've looked at clinical practice and how it's embedded in localized communities and neighborhoods like community healthcare nursing. Um, a lot of strand of research has also looked at an environment in a very broad way and looked at sort of envi local environmental health and environmental conditions, pollution and, envi and climate change and things like that. And then finally, there's a very practical uh, field of nursing research and in, in, uh, nursing geography that looks at career movements. Uh, and these social, cultural, and economic forces that shape them at local levels, at national levels, and at the global level. So there's a lot of stuff out there. and There's, there's other ways you could categorize this literature as well. I also want to focus briefly here on, on an area of nursing research which is specifically focused on evidence-based practice and knowledge translation. So in addition to these, these other empirical interests, Nurses have, be, have become interested in evidence place and its relationship to evidence-based practice and, and, and KT. So there's been a number of strands of, uh, of, of, uh, of studies. The first is an approach that involves place as evidence. Places can be created or manipulated as practice interventions. I mentioned that earlier. Secondly, there's an approach considering the place specificity of evidence. Scholars have examined how evidence is produced within and exported from particular places. With respect to randomized control trials, for example, the personal, professional, and technical aspects of clinical settings are unique, and thus they make clinical interventions somewhat unique. And they question, therefore one can question, the exportability or the generalizability of their findings to other places. Third is a more critical approach which looks at the impact of place on evidence-based practice. And it, it considers evidence-based practice as a powerful movement in, in itself. And it considers the way in which evidence-based practice is institu institutionally produced and reinforced in both academic and clinical places. And how it moves and motivates clinical action and debate. And the extent to which Thing, the disciplines like geography and sociology is included or excluded as a form of legitimate knowledge. Moving on to knowledge translation, two approaches have been taken. The first is a critical approach that considers the introduction of evidence into places. Indeed, the nature of how research evidence is collected and applied differs between individuals, institutions, and localities, and involves different kinds of networking. Moreover, the economic, social, cultural, political, and historical forces specific to specific set settings help or hinder knowledge translation. Secondly, and, and finally, under knowledge translation, is an approach that looks at the geography of knowledge translation. So how does knowledge translation work out as a concept in different places? It applies theories of place, scale, and mobility to the ways in which knowledge translation has been implemented in different countries and around the globe. So that's a, a very uh, a brief uh, <laughs> summary of uh, many, many studies in nursing geography and where we're at at the moment. So for the final uh, third of my talk, I want to move on, as I said, and, and just be a little bit more visionary and uh, try and point to some areas that might be developed. And of course, I have my own biases. There happens to be, you know, uh, 
theoretical areas that I'm personally interested in. So it's not exclusive, an exclusive way forward. I think, though, it's one way, one, one, one way that we should consider. And, and I'm interested in, in, in an emergence of a theoretical tradition uh, that's uh, 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 in geography in the last few years called non-representational theory. So non-representational theory has its origins in the work of Nigel Thrift in the mid-1990s, but it has a far more wider application in geography in the new century. It's based on the observation that a sizable proportion of the world, what happens out there in everyday life, like what is happening now in this room, has been suffocated and remains unrepresented by social constructivist research that stops the world, freezes it, and digs for identity. And this can be attributed to social constructivism's deep philosophical commitment involving theoretically driven interpretive searches for significance and for the sake of the orders, structures and processes imposed by researchers who employ it. In contrast, non-representational theory under, uh, uh, and it, it, it does not view the world as something external waiting to be represented and theorized away by a detached observer or researcher. Instead, non-representational theory understands <coughs> the world by living it, by engaging with it, and sees it as an ongoing performative achievement. Thus, non-representational theory moves the focus of inquiry away from drilling down to find meaning and onto the many subtle, unspoken, and often unintentional performances and practices involved in the reproduction of life. It explains and conveys the geography of what happens now, the bare bones and the taking place of occasions. So, but non-representational theory isn't really, as I'll show you, a theory in itself. It's really a diverse way of looking at the world and doing research. It's a, it's a broad approach. Um, I would like to take it further here in the remaining slides um, and, 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 and articulate non-representational theory as a research style. A style, and by style, I mean I don't mean a tweak here and there to the way we do things, or things, or some cosmetic or surface adjustment. Uh, adjustment. I mean a particular way of researching that involves the fundamental things that are looked for, are looked at, the methods employed, and the way the world is engaged and presented. So there, I think I have about nine facets of non-representational theory, and I'm going to give you some examples of healthcare of how it work, could work in healthcare as well. The first facet of non-representational theory is on-flow, the on-flow of life. To look for the moving processional frontier of existence as it rolls out, creating space and time. Existence happens. Life is continually taking place. Thus, to view it as stopped, like social constructivism does a lot, and then to dig for meaning, is to present life as an afterthought and to miss most of what it actually involves. As Nigel Thrift says, 95% of life just happens and we don't, we don't reflect on it. It's semi-conscious. It's less than fully conscious. But it is 95% of life. In a healthcare context, on-flow could, could involve, for instance, if you wanted to look at a primary healthcare clinic, if you're a social constructivist, you might sort of do some research interviews on people and talk about their meanings of, of, the, of the primary healthcare clinic, the waiting room, the reception area, what it means to work there, etc. In contrast, non-representational theory would look at and try to consider the unfolding of time and space in that clinic, in that reception area, in that waiting room. It would try and convey to the clients walking in, some sitting, others walking out, some coughing, doors opening and shutting calls from staff that direct clients, phones ringing, computers bleeping, the television on in the corner, and what that feels like. Does it feel overbearing? Does it feel artificial? Does it make you feel worse, um, depending on the environment? These are moments that are constantly being created, each creating a potential leading into the next moment. They're transitions that become so seamless that life becomes one unrolling moment. The second concept in non-representational theory is affect. Affect in basic terms, and I'm trying to describe this in like three minutes, it's a bit complicated, is a mobile energy or intensity which results from physical interactions between all things, objects and bodies, interacting and moving in place, from atoms and molecules to matter to more fully formed objects and bodies. 
It's an intensity that is, and physicality that's unconsciously acted, yet is experienced as a less than fully conscious feeling or sensation, a feeling state that manifests on a, somat a somatic register as a vague yet intense vibe or atmosphere. One can think of effect then as a part of our life that's endlessly streaming, sandwiched between in, its streaming as the environment, situated between but complex re complexly related to, to what is physically happening in the world and what we observe, reason and to know has happened. So it's sandwiched between the conscious and the physical and unconscious and it rolls out. We know if we go into a certain bar or a pub, it's got a vibe, it's got an atmosphere. Same with a club, a restaurant, same with a city centre. There is a vibe, we register it, we feel it. And the idea is that this vibe, this affect, can help and uh, can impact upon our well-being in positive or negative ways through, our, through the, uh, having a bearing on our energy and our capacity for engagement and involvement. So Deleuze argues that while negative affection acts like a toxin that weighs us down and reduces our capacity to operate phys physically and mentally, positive affection acts as a nutrition that carries us forward, increases our capacity to operate physically and mentally. I always think about it in teams as well, home crowd advantage, you know, playing at home as opposed to playing away, and that crowd, that energy, that atmosphere, and how that energizes. Now, what is important is although certain affects may, may arise from relatively natural uh, situations, like if we walked into a natural environment, for instance, uh, most affects are a result of human manipulation, even if even not, not specifically designed, design, a place might be not specifically designed to create an affect, but it has an affect. Um, and as Thrift says, um, affects are increasingly offered by interested parties that purposely provide certain textured feels to the things we do and the places we reside. The third uh, um, uh, facet of non-representational the theory is relationality. And I think there are, there are three uh, key types of relationality within non-representational theory. The first is to embrace a relational materialism that emphasizes the co-equal importance and co-evolution of human bodies and non-human objects. So actor network theory is quite popular, for instance. The second is a performed relationality that emphasizes how these objects and bodies are networked, assembled, and interact. And the third is a transcaled relationality, which emphasizes that life in any one place, like this room, however small and micro, is actually complexly connected to ideas, objects, events, and processes that span vast geographical distances up until the global level. So together, these three forms of relational thinking constitute an overall perspective that is chronologically post-humanist, uh, and in an approach is more than human. And it's, it's really skeptical of approaches that are overly person-centered, biographical, and then tend to single out, narrow down, and bracket phenomena. As Anderson and, Harris, uh, and Harrison suggest, non-representational theory uh, looks at associations, mutuality, co-fabrication, the word and meaning more to researchers than the word is. So a, an example, uh, I did some research on holistic healthcare, for instance, and the relationalities there were many. Uh, they included the arrangements, interactions, and movements of oils, herbs, and scents, and even ideas that were imported to clinics from afar. They included a clinic's decoration, the furniture, the accessories that were semi-permanently semi in situ. And they also included the bodies of the therapists and the clients moving relationally to, in, in relation to each other as a treatment unfolded during the course of a therapy session. These relationalities uh, created a certain affect, vibe, and atmosphere to the therapeutic, therapeutic session. The fourth uh, facet of non-representational theory is practice and performance. This contrasts with a preoccupation in other types of research on states of mind, such as thoughts, ideas, motivations, values, beliefs, attitudes, and so on. In contrast, practice and performance is about the expressive engagement of the body and bodies together. 
and bodies and objects together, whether they be engagements that are expected, unexpected, intentional or unintentional. The world is thought to be constantly productive. In a surgical medical procedure, for instance, we have nurses and doctors re relating to each other and interacting through time in a space, limiting their actions and movements to the finest of degrees. They all have different roles and parts to play, but they work and act together like a single entity. In home care, for example, a formal carer might make their way around a client's home with a certain look, in a certain way, with certain motions that reflect the highly regulated and standardized nature of their practice and its regulation. But this way of performing within a home might contrast with those actions, looks, ways, motions of the client, their friends, and their family. Another facet of non-representational theory is to look at the mundane. And what I mean by the mundane is looking at everyday events in life and the places which they occur. Everyday things mean the, are the routine things we do. We walk, we shop, we garden, we clean. And they help us cope with and be successful in our lives. These constitute the rhythms of our lives and the rhythms of our towns, cities and regions. The places where these events occur include the office, the kitchen, the bathroom, the shopping mall, the motorway. And they're often taken for granted and remain outside the awareness, our full awareness as we occupy them and move through them, but also through, uh, with outside the awareness of academic scholarship. In term, for example, in terms of well-being, the everyday for us could include, for example, a simple walk to work. It might be therapeutic to us, it might be restorative, it might just make us feel a little bit better if it's a nice walk to work. And the places involved would include the scenery, the roads, the buildings one passes through and by on your journey to work. The sixth facet of non-representational theory is wonderment. And this seems a bit of a hippie fay uh, 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 approach. But you know, our, uh, it really is just about looking at the world slightly differently. Looking at the world with a renewed sense of wonderment having an appreciation for an excitement to witness and be part of all its modest happenings. Uh, to really try and engage what, with what, what is immediately happening and all the movement and energy this involves. So this facet is more of a disposition the researcher has. He or she must be able to look at healthcare setting or a natural landscape, for example, through a clearer, less transformative lens, through eyes unburdened by immediate thoughts of where the power lies or where the social divisions may be. They must be able to take in the detail, feel the feels involved, and when they, look, when, they, when they engage, look to animate and reverberate these to their audience. Now this is going to have to involve some kind of method. And it involves tweaks and changes to qualitative research, for sure. So a seventh facet related to the sixth is to witness, act into, change and boost, and help the world and help it speak back. I'll, I'll talk about uh, these specifically. Well, one way is to try and produce, uh, although there is no non-representational theory methodological toolkit, one has not been developed. Generally, uh, scholars try to produce case-specific methodological hybrids uh, so that they don't go too far down contemplative paths and interpretive paths, and they are attempting to present, not re-represent, what occurs in life. So witnessing, for example, is to pay to attention to all the occurrences that, even, that happen in an event, that, that even if they might be mundane. And by doing this, it's hoped that the emerging data you collect might have a fidelity to and a close resemblance with the events that took place. One approach to enhance witnessing, for example, is to use more than one method, to combine maybe observation with photography, with film, and combine those kinds of visual things with your written notes as a secondary sensory insight. Acting into, on the other hand, um, denotes a closer relationship between the researcher and what is happening in the field, a blurring of the role of observer and what is observed. So, for example, in non-representational theory, interviewing could be as much about the interaction in the interview itself as the story is told. 
and participant observation can be flipped to observant particip participation, which is um, about doing exactly the same thing as the subject and getting far more embroiled and invested in their effort and their activity than traditional participant observation. Trying also to actively intervene to change happenings. And this point brings me to the last uh, uh, facet, which is changing and boosting and speaking back. Non-representational theory wants to create new realities. It wants to create new forms of knowledge translation. And this has led to things like arts-based methods and a general agenda towards <coughs> activist uh, scholarship and public scholarship. Uh, an eighth facet uh, is uh, an eclectic disciplinary philosophical and theoretical heritage. Non-representational theory it draws on and attempts to bring together diverse subdisciplines such as performance studies, material cultural studies, ecological anthropology, sociology of the senses and emotions, and diverse theoretical approaches such as actor network theory biological philosophy, performance theory, vitalism, neo-materialism, and social ecology. A wide variety of disciplines and approaches there. The idea is, though, that a freedom should exist to pick and choose between theory and not get too bogged down in theory itself. To frame and inform a study, but not get too wrapped up in interpretation and adjusting the theory itself, or rethinking the theory itself. The idea is to make data and qualitative knowledge and to free it from being subservient or secondary to theory. Where, and to, to make telling come to the fore and to prevent telling becoming buried under the bulky business of knowing. So non-representational theory, in terms of theory, constitutes a lively engagement with theory that itself mirrors the lively world that one is interested in presenting. Now, to some people, uh, this might seem a bit of a theoretical cop-out. Uh, but for non-representational theorists, it's, more, it's just a, simply a matter of what helps one get to and, and, and present the active world. The final facet is related. I like to think of it as trying to speak the language of the world to the world. Academics, at some stage, have to write. Right? There are REAs, or REFs, you call them in the UK. We need to publish. But I think we need to develop a lively style of communicating with words that doesn't immediately lock into rigid, exclusionary academic frames, but it instead creates itself and recreates itself in the images of the very practices it wants to present. Now, this isn't unproblematic or easy, as the formal academic style we've all been trained in and we're all accustomed to itself justifies the very existence of academic scholarship separating it and what academics do from fiction, fantasy, and investigative journalism. Nevertheless, I think we can employ a number of quite specific techniques to create an irrealist mood in one's writing. And this involves, as Vanini outlines, a number of sub-moods, including the conditional mood, stating in your research and your writing propositions, not certainties, with conditions. The potential mood, being tentative and acknowledging other possibilities. The fallible mood, acknowledging that the writer can have doubt and in ignorance. The hypothetical mood, exploring possibilities and posing if, what if. The immediate mood, and this is very important for non-representational theory, writing as if in the moment, as if things are unfolding right then, without a prior or known outcome. The admirative mood, expressing outwardly wonder, fascination, surprise. Subjunctive mood, expressing states of uncertainty, unreality about things that haven't occurred. And the desirative mood, expressing your own wants, wishes, and preferences in your research. So it's not a complete change to this, but just to bring some of these things in. Together they represent a movement away from the bland professional language we've all come accustomed to that's bare of expression, performance, and unpredictability, to a language that's shared by those who work in the arts, that's sometimes written, that's sometimes spoken aloud, that's filled with and celebrates these things. Now, I'm going to finish off now, uh, just a couple of slides to go. 
You know, there's a lot of uh, debate about, you know, wh what is the consequence of non-representational theory for human geography, for health geography, potential uh, geographies of nursing. And one of the problems is, or one of the criticisms is, you know, if, you, if we all move to non-representational theory, what about identity? What about meaning? What about difference? Does this get lost? And I would su suggest, yes, I don't think any term to non-representational theory in any subdiscipline, it, it should not be a replacement for other research. It's just something to go alongside research. And we were talking about it in the pub last night. Maybe it doesn't become a strong tradition. Maybe it just helps certain researchers, including social constructivists, just think about the lively. Think about articulating them what's happening in space and time a little bit more than just going straight for meaning and identity and things like that. So I think that you know, it can be incorporated into existing traditions. And I think there's sort of three, three points of convergence between, say, social constructivism and non-representational theory. And the first is where a social constructive study or research might inform, locate, or even motivate a study using non-representational theory. It, for example, it might highlight a particular condition, predicament, demographic issue, place, which a study of the active world might help inform. Secondly, uh, our commentators have suggested that even within individual studies, a researcher can develop a nomadic consciousness and look for both the representational and the unrepresentation, non-representational. So you can look about what's happening and also look about uh, identity. Um, a third is to use studies uh, on non use that develop and, and draw on non-representational theory to lead into further research on meaning and identity. In certain contexts, this might quite literally be the next stage, as following effects, individuals' emotions and other fully cognitive thoughts and actions come into play. I think this, these kind of looking at, acknowledging these points of convergence and embracing it, the one way that that we could, we could incorporate non-representational theory without a fear that we're going to lose something in scholarship. So some final thoughts. Non-representational theory is the next big development in post-structural human geography. Um, so it really needs to be considered, even if one uh, comes to the conclusion it's not for you, or maybe it's not for the geographies of nursing more generally, it needs to be considered and debated. Some have even said that it's a successor to postmodern theory in human geography. It could be that fundamental. Nursing research needs to engage, I think, and at least explore the potential uh, of trying to engage with and convey the active worlds of health and healthcare. Um, Non-representational theory is only you know, my preference, my approach, and I'm sure that each of you will have your own ideas and ways that geographies and nursing could be progressed and forwarded uh, in the next few years. Thanks very much. Thank you.